Okay, I think we can start our next session and our, our final session with the panel. And most of these people you have come to know quite well through the day in one way or the other, so I'm not going to reintroduce them uh, in any detail. I think you know Janice and David Goolsby, and you certainly have met Chanta, Nugon, and Dr. Bill Pop, James Nardella, and Jenna Nardella. And we have asked them to comprise this last session to address uh, the kinds of questions that you perhaps haven't had an opportunity to ask today and to just have an interactive discussion given their different perspectives and also their, their similar um, goals uh, that they have worked to achieve through time. So with that, the committee had several questions that they really thought would be important and interesting. And, and some of their personal journeys, I think we've heard them speak about. But I'd like to open it up and ask you all to sort of address what you're comfortable sharing with regard to what really led you on this path to look at global health as a, uh, a way of your professional life and perhaps your personal life, and also uh, to address how each of you, because you clearly all do, have seen utilizing interactive and interdisciplinary approaches and collaborative approaches to achieving those goals. So it's sort of a two-fold question that I will just sort of throw out to the panel, and I don't know who might like to, to begin with that, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, my is the microphone on? Can you hear all right? Uh, after 1965, in a uh, summer of overseas studies in South Korea, realizing back then South Korea was not quite as hot as Vietnam, but uh, I had an overseas studies program there for the summer. I was invited back by a, a veterinarian doctor, an American, to be involved in an agricultural project. Uh, within the first year of that, I remember early one October morning, it was frost in the air. I took an old Alice Chambers seed tractor with a two-bottom plow out to plow up an old sweet potato patch to, uh, on a demonstration farm. Uh, the Korean who was training uh, couldn't make it that early. He was coming in uh, later, so I uh, thought I'd go ahead and get started. I made two rounds. Uh, the second round, uh, there were two young boys, half naked, uh, uh, obviously exposed to the cold weather, that I had to climb off the tractor and separate from fighting over a dirty sweet potato that the plow kicked up on top. One was getting ready to gouge the other one's eyes out. I separated them, found out with my limited Korean at that time that they'd spent the night in a culvert. Uh, uh, where I'd dro driven the tractor into the field and found out that there was a young girl uh, in that, about six years old. Uh, these two boys were eight or nine years old. They had escaped from an orphanage, spent the night in that culvert. I, I went down to the culvert and uh, drug the young girl out. She ended up dying in my arms. Every time I look into the eyes of my five children when they're young, I cannot help but see the eyes of that young girl, but all three of those kids. There's something about that experience, and I've been into famine-stricken areas where I've seen people die by the thousands, but with that incident, uh, that changed my life. I decided uh, agriculture and agricultural development is going to be my life forte. Uh, and that experience got me involved. Uh, my wife-to-be at that time, uh, I think, will say something. Similar. Pretty much when I married David, I could see that that's where we were headed. We farmed for several years, but always he would come back to the story and he, how much he desired to be some part of mission work. 
And after we closed out our farming operation, then eventually he started working with Healing Hands and to combine farming and missions was just the ideal job for him. And so it's been my privilege to be able to travel with him for the last few years and experience the, to see just how we can help people in other countries, how we can encourage them not only to help them but to help themselves and to see some of these um, terribly stricken countries that are needing help get the help that they need through learning new ways of uh, producing their own food and then preserving their own food. I was lucky to have uh, my parents send me to school. And then uh, no matter how my life turned to be during the war, after the war, we run away from Cambodia to Vietnam and then Vietnam to, to back to Cambodia to Thailand. My life always, we always find a solution to get over the challenge because I have a bit of education. And how, how, then I, I work with a sex worker uh, during uh, my experience in stunt training with MSF. And they have no chance. And um, first I work with them when they're still very beautiful, working in the brothel, and then we educate them, and then they ended up dying in my arms. More than 10 of them dying in the hospital in my arms. And I find it, they are very brave. They die alone. They refuse to let me help to bring them, send them back to their family. So from that, so from that experience, I decided I am too lucky. I have to share and I have to save other women as I can. Yeah, and that's drive me into what I'm doing now. And I'm still always feel just to share is too easy for me to do. So whatever I have, I have. I give lots of, lots of support of people around the world, from you, from everybody. And my role is just to simply share it with other women and to help them to be independent. And that's for me such an easy job to do. Thank you. Well, ironically, I have to thank uh, the Duvaliers because if they were not in power at that time, I would have studied medicine in Haiti. But uh, because it was so politically uh, involved in everybody would get admitted, uh, although I did well in, in high school, my chances would have been very limited. So I knew I would study medicine abroad, but it was always to come back to Haiti. And I remember my advisor at Columbia University told me, uh, when you're going for your interview, do not say that you want to go back to Haiti because we don't have enough physicians in the States, so clearly. Uh, so I listened to her carefully and uh, I had an interview uh, at Cornell and the interview went very, very well and then at the end, that question came in, uh, do you plan to go back? And, Spontaneously, I said yes. So the four of them stood up and they told me, uh, we're going to review your application and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you. At that time, there was no matching. This was 1971. So after about 10 minutes that looked like an hour, they came back and they told me uh, they are not going to hold this against me and that if I want to come in, uh, uh, I'll be accepted. So that, that was very important. But then uh, when I came back, my, b before I came back, I was uh, thinking of doing works on malaria, uh, thinking that malaria resistance is something that would be big in Haiti because there were already cases in Colombia in 1962. Colombia had flights directly to Haiti, so I said, well, that's probably a big area. And uh, at the time, Dr. Traeger at Rockefeller University was uh, cultivating the organism to study the resistance. He was the only one doing that. So I started learning how to do that. 
when I went, when I went to Haiti, uh, the government was in charge of malaria, and my uncle, who was a physician there, told me, don't get involved with anything that has to do with the government. You would not last a few days. And then Ben Keen at Cornell, who was a very famous mentor uh, in diarrheal diseases, said to me, uh, you should study diarrhea. This is really the most important killer of babies in your country. So uh, I went back, and uh, I didn't think I would last a week because this was the most difficult experience in my life. Uh, just imagine that you have large rooms and babies dying every 15 or 20 minutes. Now the person who's coming to get them, uh, he will wait for an hour or two and put them in a bag. So you have three, four, five babies in one single bag. It was horrible. Uh, so my, my project was to study the causes of infantile diarrhea. But when I saw that the mortality was so high, I had to change gear. And we eventually studied the causes, but we said, let's treat them first. So that was. And then the change came in when I found out with something very simple. It was nothing magic. Uh, essentially making sure that babies who came in receive immediate attention. At first, they would stay uh, in, in a waiting room, waiting like everybody else, but their diarrhea continued, and from moderate or light dehydration, they would get into severe and die. Essentially, bypassing this, making sure that all of them went to the unit. Don't ask any questions, start providing oral fluid. Don't ask anything. You'll ask the question later. And then anybody who had fever after they were rehydrated, work them up for the infections. And then with this, you know, the mortality drops so, so rapidly. And then seeing the mothers who stayed with the babies uh, being so involved with this and promoting the project, this has been the change. Because that's when I was able to integrate the community because the mothers were there as part of the program. And then the mobile teams that later on went to help people who were trained. And we are doing the same thing with HIV, it's duplicating exactly that and integrating more of what we did before into the HIV program. So really, this is what made the difference. I think my uh, global health practice is probably a little bit of an unorthodox story. I had. Uh, grown up in a small town in central Pennsylvania, gone off to college in Boston to study acting, of all things, and took my college summers, uh, took opportunities to go overseas. It was the first time I'd ever flown on a plane, and I went to Kyrgyzstan, and then uh, another summer in Bolivia. And for the first time I saw, like many of probably of the Western folks sitting in this room, I saw poverty firsthand. Um, and knew deeply that somehow, no matter what I was going to do with the rest of my life, that I had to take into account that that exists. And I didn't know what that meant at the time, but that somehow I was, I was implicated. But I moved to New York City and pursued acting for eight years, had a semi, uh, um, what, what am I trying to say, semi-successful career um, as an actor. And then in 2006, the bug uh, to get back overseas um, bit me again. And I, I went and worked in Kenya to start a secondary school. And while I was there living with the Kenyan family, it just occurred to me that nobody cared that I had been on TV. It didn't, you know, when I, that realization that I had had 10 years earlier, that whatever I did had to take into account that this exists, wasn't really playing itself out because nothing that I had done at that point really was manifesting change in those people's lives. And it was the first time that I really came to grips with the, the powerful effects of girls' education and the health effects that come in turn, the social and economic effects that come in turn. And I decided to pursue a, a graduate degree in international education. Um, and that's led to my work in global health. And it just so happens that while I was traveling on my way to Kenya, I also met my wife. Um, who happened to be traveling to Kenya as well. And that, that of course, has decided a lot of this course as well. I'm that wife. <clears throat> we met on a plane in Amsterdam, 
to Nairobi, and that was amazing. Um, but um, I grew up in San Francisco, and when I was nine years old, um, I remember walking through the streets of San Francisco with my mom going to dinner with her friend, and there was um, a man on the corner who smelled really bad, and he looked really dirty, and he told me that he was hungry and that he hadn't eaten in three days, and um, he just asked for something to eat. And um, I was I was pretty um, blown away by just hearing from someone who hadn't eaten because I assumed he had a mommy and a daddy who would take care of him. And I was even more surprised by the fact that nobody was listening to him. And um, I went to dinner and I sat there and I couldn't touch my food because I was so bothered by recognizing that this man hadn't eaten. So my mom, um, being compassionate that she was, she let me walk the streets of San Francisco looking for this man to give him my cold hamburger. And um, we never found him, but it was, a, it was a real strong part of my story just in the, I guess, in the art of paying attention and being able to see the people that maybe I wasn't aware of um, before. I went to college desperately wanting to be a nurse. And I was so excited to be a nurse. And I took classes. And then um, I, uh, I ended up taking a medical microbiology class on and learning about the effects of HIV. And it was unbelievable. Um, I was terrible at science, but I was understanding that what was happening was that this virus was attacking the weakest parts of our immune system. And it was terrifying to see it. Um, and then I actually had the opportunity to meet some people in, um, in my town who were living with HIV and trying to understand what that was about. Uh, and then I ended up just starting to see the newspapers. This was early 2000, and there were meetings in Barcelona, and there were all these different AIDS conventions that were coming together because AIDS was global. And it was even more complicated in different places. But the thing that really struck um, me was the recognition that AIDS doesn't just affect the weakest um, parts of our immune system, it's attacking the weakest members of our society. And, um, and so that's really what got me from sort of the local to the global. I actually failed as a nurse. Um, I pass out in hospitals. Who knew? Um, not the best thing um, to do when you have patients, but um, I just decided to try to pursue another way of advocating for healthcare globally and without having to be the one to administer any of the needles or shots or anything like that. Um, one other little caveat is just that I've, in my vocation and calling, I've talked a lot about and believed that people in Africa, people in Cambodia, people in Haiti, people all over the world, that there are brothers and our sisters. And we talk about the concept of neighbor is changing. So that's been something I've really wanted to advocate for. Um, and a couple of years ago, I actually got a call from my mom um, who, my parents lost their first child at 11 months, and she had um, a heart defect. But um, she had received a letter from a San Francisco hospital about a year after Jessica passed and said that um, your daughter was actually contracted with a virus that we're not sure what it is. Um, they got a follow-up letter to find out that that was HIV. And so um, it was, uh, she, she died from a heart complication, but had she survived, she would have been HIV positive in the early 80s. So it just came full circle. So I think the committee had thought that because each of these people represent a pretty astounding program, it might be interesting to hear what was the history of, of who uh, they, they were and how they came to, to um, develop those programs. So let me throw it open to you all. Um, yes, we do want to hear more about how you uh, arrived at, at believing in an interactive, uh, multidisciplinary approach to, to providing care in global health settings. But before you do, I think maybe we'll ask the um, audience if there are any particular things they'd like to, to bring up or ask questions about at this point. Somebody can ask the second question. Okay, I guess you've got so, so one of the things that we typically have been so interested in doing is, is taking a multi-dimensional uh, approach to trying to deal with health 
issues and problems. And that's what I would just ask you all to, to sort of comment on whomever among you wants to. I'm, I'm hopeful that that theme was clear to people today, that as we interacted, that we see that um, the, the multi-dimensional aspects of poverty and how they relate to health and how we're trying to take in that concept together. Um, for me, when I mentioned that girls' education was um, sort of fundamental to my understanding of um, poverty in general and the effects that um, one sector could have on another, because we know that sending a girl to school obviously has exponential effects on future family wellness, on the wellness of her children, even on the effects of HIV on that, on that girl's um, prospects in life. And, and we know that it also has an effect on the um, fact that her future children will go to school. We know that it has an effect on the nutrition and well-being of those future children and their economic opportunities. And so, you know, I, working in Lawala, where I work, we have really tried to conceptualize um, our programming to address these multiple dimensions. So just taking that girl as an example, I, I like to say, you know, in Lawala, there, there didn't used to be access to health care, but four years ago. Now there is. So you've got a mother, she's taken her, her child to the health center, she now has access to health care, but the girl still has limited possibilities in school. So we have programs to incentivize girls to complete school. If I can keep that girl in school, but she doesn't have a job opportunity when she comes out, she, the mother still fundamentally sees her child's prospects as being poor. I don't think uh, our friends who are poor really separate out those, uh, those individual areas. So to silo them like we do in academia doesn't make much sense. So um, if we can provide her with, with health care, with good educational opportunities, with economic opportunities, she's very likely to leave the village unless we also instill her with the sense of hope and pride in the place where she comes from. So we also need to build up those institutions which insert a sense of cultural pride, spiritual hope in the individual. So I think uh, we try to embody that wraparound or multidimensional approach as much as possible because it's just common sense to someone who is poor that those areas, those aspects of poverty are not fundamentally separate. From, from our standpoint, we started by integrating the various species within health itself. Uh, first, research, service, and patient care. Uh, they are very, very interdependent uh, because what we do, we look at a public health problem to research, we try to find a solution. If we are lucky, we find a solution. We train people, uh, teach them what we've found, and they can use that themselves to multiply patient care. So it has a multiplication effect. Then we try to integrate diseases. Uh, we look at HIV, well, HIV is a sexually transmitted disease. We are involved in other sexually transmitted diseases. TB is so closely related to HIV that we have to get into tuberculosis. Uh, we do both prevention and care because they are also integrated. Not one is more important than the other. Both are important. Family planning is essential because uh, in our PMTCT program, the ideal thing would be to give a woman who doesn't want to become pregnant the means not to become pregnant because uh, instead of risking giving her antiretrovirals uh, if she doesn't want to be pregnant. Uh, we also integrate rape victims because uh, our site is ideal for rape victims because we can provide them with counseling, we can provide them with prevention of pregnancy, recognition of other sexually transmitted disease, and refer them to uh, uh, law uh, lawyers who can, if they decide to pursue uh, the aggressor. We develop now something new because when we're dealing with a community, the community is not necessarily sick. And the community, you have to see it a bigger community. Uh, the community needs jobs, that's number one. And uh, if you can help them with jobs, in order to have jobs, they need to have some skills. So we keep, if we can provide them with some skills, that's important. 
microcredit is very important because it also gives them some activities to do. And we found that microcredit, microcredit has changed their financial situation. In many ways, they've been able to obtain more credit and be more independent. Now, the next step is to provide support for their kids to go to school and eventually their own habitat. So really, it's a whole global health concept. As, as I said before, this is a new concept, but it has not been tested. And there is the opportunity to test it on the ground. So that's what we hope to do. Uh, where I learned the importance of integrated disciplines that combine such uh, areas as agriculture with uh, health, education, going back to Korea of the, of the 60s, um, I remember specifically um, about a year after the event, the personal event that I told you when I was in Korea for a five-year uh, tour about two years in Korea in 1968 suffered a crisis. Uh, in fact, I was very discouraged up until this time and through this crisis. The crisis uh, in Vietnam was known as the Tet Offensive. Uh, very few Americans realized that the counterpart of the communist world was creating its own Tet Offensive in Korea. It, we know it as a Pueblo incident, but there is also a mini invasion. This was in January, uh, right in back of our uh, dairy operation, uh, the model farm, a commando squad of uh, uh, North Koreans infiltrated with the uh, objective of assassinating President Park Chung-hee and as many uh, people as possible. They failed, they killed a number of Korean civilians and fled back into the mountains trying to make it through the deep snow uh, below zero temperatures in the North Korea. Our farm was called or off. Uh, U.S. Army and ROK Army officers showed up and said, uh, we believe war is about to break out. You're to come up with a contingency plan to kill all your dairy animals, burn all the crops, and flee south, get south of the Han River. We will come back uh, first thing tomorrow and tell you whether or not to implement. You are to prepare. Well, it cooled off enough. We could hear gunfire and so forth around at night, but it cooled off uh, enough so that it must have shaken. Uh, up until that time, we were having problems with corruption, dealing with uh, petty bribery and uh, everything from A to Z. But I don't know what Lyndon Johnson told Pak Chung. He must have uh, told the president that you either wise up or we're going to pull out. But things started immediately changing to the point to where, and uh, I'm not a big Lyndon Johnson fan, but I have to give him credit. He, he drew out of retirement uh, retirees uh, from the uh, Marshall Plan rebuilding and USAID and USOM, as well as those who worked for General MacArthur in land reforms and uh, economic, including rural economic development in post-World War II Japan. He called these out of retirement. He sent them in Korea through the USAID, USOM programs. Uh, suddenly, we started getting cooperation uh, from everywhere because we were on the ground working at the grassroots. I have to give credit to these 70-year-old uh, retirees. Most of them had their advanced PhD equivalents back then of MBA. I don't even know what you called them back then, but they knew how to build an economy from the soil up, not throwing money just in at the top and expecting it to trickle down. And so uh, people who cannot feed themselves cannot be uh, build an economy. You have to lay down that foundation. They knew how to lay down that foundation, and the miracle of South Korea, they were doing the same things. We were called into Taiwan. We saw the same things happening in Taiwan. And so we uh, learned the importance of integrated disciplines. They not only uh, were involved in ag uh, agriculture, but Korea was 78% uh, rural uh, farmers at that time. Uh, they knew how to integrate educational development, uh, health development, pull it all together. 
And that is, I can tell you uh, as an eyewitness, I know when the miracle of South Korea and the four tiger, uh, tiger, uh, uh, Asian tigers began. It began under that. It seems like uh, our, our foreign aid development has, has grown wary in that we throw money in at the top and expect it to trickle down. But unless you've got a program going in at the grassroots that is rule-oriented in those disciplines, health, education, agriculture, that lays that foundation that has something to come up, okay, we're here, where's the money? We knew it was thrown in at the top. We need the money out here to distribute to help uh, these grassroots projects take root and, and grow. And so uh, by having that experience of watching that take place, I was a young person, uh, 22 years of age. I had no idea of how to build an economy, but watching that take place uh, right there. And the other example is just very simple. Uh, Dr. Sidney Allen, who's now near 80 years old, my mentor, I worked side by side with him for about five years. It was a simple matter. When we went together, I followed him carrying equipment out into a Korean village. He was called out there to treat a sick ox uh, or a, uh, uh, a goat, and he'd finish his work, and then the women of the village uh, would line up with their kids and they'd want him to start treating ailments, you know, of the family. And there was a good example, just simple uh, common sense interaction uh, in those days uh, under those conditions of agriculture with medicine. I think um, the lesson that I had was when we stepped into um, wanting to address HIV in Africa, spent a lot of time in the communities and asked um, different um, community leaders, what is the best way that we can come alongside and help with HIV? And I was expecting some sort of medical um, orphan, widow, some sort of um, focus on that. And they actually said water. And that was shocking to me. I didn't understand that water could be connected to HIV. And so they explained to me further that um, you know, people who have HIV are, have really weak immune systems. And so when they drink bad water, which is usually um, the general type of water, whether it's from a river or a puddle, um, water that's being shared by animals and people, that something as simple as diarrhea or some other waterborne disease can end up killing someone who is HIV positive. Um, even if they had medication and they were HIV positive, um, they couldn't take it with bad water. Or women who had children that were um, not HIV positive, but the mother is positive, um, you would uh, you would try to give them breast. Uh, sorry, you try to give them formula so they wouldn't breastfeed. But then you can't mix bad water with the formula because then you end up hurting your child even more. Um, so it was just really interesting. Even girls that have to walk to get water, that means they don't go to school. Girls' education is one of the greatest, they call it the AIDS, the education AIDS vaccine, social vaccine. So it's, it helps reduce the, um, the prevalence of HIV in girls. So that was a big lesson for us, and hence our organization, Blood Water Mission, clean blood, blood free from HIV, and clean water. But I hadn't understood that connection in the beginning. Yes. So I had a question for um, perhaps a little more specifically for Dr. Pop. Um, I'm intrigued by what you had said on the panel and in a discussion earlier. We're not really, to put it bluntly, we're not quite sure if global health works. Now, on the one hand, it seems obvious it does work. We can recognize when we see it. On the other hand, we have some parameters for looking to see an agricultural thing can re intervention can result in upliftment. We make a health intervention and we can see some of the mortality statistics improving. But I'm wondering, from a more academic point of view, do we have new instruments and assessment tools, whether from new science or implementation science or whatever, for looking at this in a more interdisciplinary kind of way, for seeing if you put this all together and look at it in an integrated manner and take into factors like sustainability, because often we think it's work and then it collapses, 
do we have better tools for assessing this? Because you said you plan to study that. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, there have been, as you know, uh, many instances where you've seen global health, global health work, but it's in a limited scale. Uh, what I'd like to look at is a country that has been on its knees, like, like Haiti, um, where you have a larger number of people who are in the streets. They have no hope. Can you rebuild their life in a global health fashion? That is, can you bring water, agriculture, nutrition, health, education? You're starting, you're starting from scratch. And your measurements would be something that you could evaluate very well. You could see how many kids were not going to school are going to school now. Uh, how many women are, are in jobs, how many men are working, etc. And eventually it will be the functionality of that whole place because you will not only look at individual success, you look at community success. So it's on a much broader scale than a simple project. That's what I meant. Do we have any other? Do we have something more academic? Do you have any more? Any better tools for assessing that? Well, we have to create the tool. Um, I agree that interdisciplinary means are really important. But what do you do when you have competing priorities from those different disciplines? and you get sort of the politics or the challenges involved. Can you speak to how you all have dealt with some of those issues? I can speak from the grassroots level in Luwala. We receive, and, and I'm sure this is familiar to those who are involved in PEPFAR, we receive PEPFAR support for antiretrovirals, but not for opportunistic infections, right? We receive PEPFAR funding for delivery of drugs, but not necessarily for um, the health and prevention that needs to go with it. So, um, you know, it, when, a, when a topic becomes a hot topic, often it donor driven, um, and, and I am in no way saying that HIV is not important, it certainly is to the people of Luwala, um, but it can, it can often drive our programs. So I think, you know, along with academia needing new tools for measurement, I think our funders in the world need new imaginations for if what we're really after, if we're, if we're truly after transforming people's lives and opening their lives up to freedoms in the broadest sense, as like Sen would say, um, and we're coming up with new indexes like the HDI to, to determine what that looks like, and we're trying, we're really trying to measure it, then we also need funding schemes that really support this kind of work. Because I can say it's very easy. L people know Lawala as the Lawala Clinic. But the moment I add a wraparound service, it becomes very hard to market. And it becomes very hard to find a funder for that holistic approach. I can go to a, sig a significant funder that just wants to fund medicines, or a funder that just wants to s uh, fund pediatrics. But finding people who want to fund those, those holistic mechanisms for really driving um, for really fighting poverty in the, in, the, in the honest sense, if any of us are honest, that's difficult. And I, I think that that would be a major improvement. Um, I, I wanted to comment on... Is it on? Okay. Um, I, I am very glad that these questions are coming up. Um, I just wanted to throw out there that, that we are looking uh, at some sort of more academic approaches to trying to figure out... Um, you know the multi multiple dimensions of uh, of health and, and poverty and, and development. Um, there is a, a model that we <coughs> are using, which is the uh, Oxford Human Development uh, model that addresses poverty from a multi multiple dimensional uh, perspective. Um, and uh, so essentially, you're you're trying to measure a, a whole bunch of different indicators. This this uh, you know education, income, uh, material consumption, uh, access to food, health, uh, and, you know disparities and even uh, things that, that, you know, we don't traditionally look in public health, which is uh, people's empowerment and, and self-esteem. So how they actually perceive themselves to be capable of taking the resources that are around them and turning them into the things that they need or want for their livelihoods. 
Um, so uh, this this is you know an idea that we had and we're trying to use it uh, in Mozambique. Uh, but I think it, the the key to, to to this whole sort of like multiple dimensional approach is to really understand how we uh, uh, you know tackle this uh, these different uh, elements in a community. You know, many of us have so much uh, sort of insight into the community that we you know have a very general but pretty good idea of what the community needs. But if we want to sort of generalize this approach to to use it in a more systematic way, we have to engage the communities and we have to really employ a participatory approach to try and identify what is it that the community themselves want and need and then see if we can get the community to, to take ownership of these things and, and you know, sort of bring them little by little or, or you know, help them facilitate in some way the process to achieving some of those goals. Thanks. I wanted to question another dimension of it. James mentioned the, the, the issue of the donors, and I think everybody at the table has probably sought funds on a fairly regular basis. And uh, I've been uh, on several foundation boards and boards where I'm voting to do this, that, or the other, and the, the, the consistency that I find in someone sends you a grant request and what's the board going to do with it is, okay, uh, three years and out or something like that. Whereas the kinds, if you've got an integrated approach, you three years and out really hurts your program rather than helps it. And you know, some say five years and out, but they'll almost always put a time limit on it. Whereas you, if you're going towards sustainability, it it seems to me it's a very complicated developmental model that involves whatever business is, is bringing income into your project plus the social programs that you run. And I don't know how the grant requests, grant, it, grant request system can be structured so that boards don't come back at you with the three years and out. I don't know if you all run into that, but I've certainly run into it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's, <laughs> it's an art in of itself. Um, I mean, organizations that are so focused on global health issues want to be focused on those global health issues and generally, you know, section off maybe 10 or 20 percent of their time trying to think about how they're going to get the funds to be able to do the work that they want to do. And, and generally, it's challenging because donors might hang a dangle a carrot for you to go this way even though really what the community is saying is we want to go this way and um, and I've been really encouraged by our interaction with donors I can't speak for government grants um, but I can speak for private foundations for individual um, donors which is really how our organization is mostly funded and um, and it's, it's a lot about um, educating. And so if we're thinking about educating communities in water, sanitation, hygiene, it's also important to bring your donors along with you in that education process. And, and it is work, but it is work that pays off so much to have people basically on your team saying, I don't want to tell you what I'm going to fund. I want to find out what you and the community are saying are the highest priorities, even if it's not a popular thing to fund, even if it seems sort of risky, um, that is the gift of finding donors um, of high capacity or foundations that say, we, we have learned that by sitting in Kansas City in our office as a foundation, we're not connected to the day-to-day -day of what's going on in a village in Western Kenya. And, and as organizations, we get to be that bridge, but we have to invest in those relationships and the education, the programming. I spent four weeks in Africa in January and February. Two of those weeks were bringing donors and advocates, and not just to come and see, but we had curriculum and books and conversations, and it's a whole process of being able to learn together. But, um, but I think that's at least a small movement um, that we're experiencing is those who are coming alongside. And once they start asking those same questions that we're asking, we get really excited. In follow-up to that, I would say uh, I've had to live under the uh, three and five year and you're out situation. 
but I also have to say that's a pretty good uh, stimulus for us uh, who are working in the field, but we've, we've got to be able to uh, show our donors, our board of directors and so forth that as you're approaching that three or five year deadline that measurable results have been achieved and then you just you just got to have uh, I guess a forceful personality or something and say are you willing to jeopardize all of this if measurable results can be achieved up through the three year period rather than cut it off we need two or three more years and you've got to uh, sell. And I've found that most of our donors are, are reasonable uh, on that. They don't want to lose their investment, but they don't want to uh, uh, have their pocketbooks like, feel like they're being eternally taken advantage of. I think just to follow up on that, the other lesson that we really learned is not seeing donors as a means to an end, but an end in and of itself, and that the relationships and the transformation that people get to participate in the mission with us, it matters. And so the more that we see, um, the more that we see our donors as our partners and, and people that we desire to serve and, and be in relationship with, the, the better the whole mission does. So I, I wonder if uh, you folks have any experience and if you'd share it with us, the, uh, the experience of doing work and providing service and then finding out that either um, another organization uh, was providing that service and maybe they overlapped or even could be seen as redundant. How did you reconcile those, those things and uh, maybe even establish collaborations or reorient your own work or the, the work of the other organization? Uh, one thing, uh, we tr I try to emphasize this principle, lighthouses don't compete. Uh, now, and also something else, uh, when I go into a, a country, and I've, I've visited over 90 countries, we've done ag projects uh, in at least 40 of them, when I go in, uh, I don't expect to introduce something new to where I think I've got to invent the wheel. Somebody is already doing what I have in mind, uh, especially farmers. Farmers are garage and basement tinkerers the world over. Uh, drip irrigation, for example, when we went into, uh, uh, in the midst of famine in Ethiopia, I started asking around. Uh, somebody's already doing this in Ethiopia. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we found a Christian Mission Alliance Vo Ag School that was already doing it, and we simply went in and contracted with them to train our Ethiopian uh, people. Uh, so it, it's, it's going in with, with the attitude, that uh, a humble attitude, that I've got more to learn than I can teach and somebody is more than likely already doing it and doing a pretty good job. Uh, they're just isolated. Uh, uh, okay, find, uh, and another expression, find who God is already working with and go in attached to that uh, and uh, see how you can help and integrate that. Uh, so that's a philosophy that, uh, that we use, try to use. Okay, we're gonna take one more question. Uh, I, I'm thinking, maybe following up on that question, uh, I rem in, the, in the previous presentation by Dr. Pab, there was um, sort of a competition of NGOs and a mess um, brought by NGOs. How do we, how can we fight that and, and, and maybe be proactively advocating for the poor we serve against that competition of NGOs? Well, uh, as I said, it starts with the donors because they are the one who swing the pendulum totally on one side that is for the government, only NGOs, and uh, 
there needs to be a balance. So hopefully they will get it right. You need to support two organizations who are working for the same people. And it's wrong to put one in competition with the other for funding because both need it. So I think that eventually the message will get across. But as you know, it's either you have everything or you have nothing. But now, among the NGOs, we've never had any problems because we think that there are ways to collaborate. We collaborate with a large number of NGOs. We, we train NGOs. We learn from them. They learn from us. And it's, it's a situation where if you all work towards a common goal, there can be no competition. So I think that you know, it's the end that you have to look at at all times. And if I think that somebody can do something better than us, instead of competing, we'll learn from them uh, or we'll let them do it completely and we'll do something else that we can do very well. So I, I think that you know, it shouldn't be a problem. And let me just say that believing in integrated approaches doesn't mean that you have to be the implementer on every approach. So, for instance, in Lawala, it, because we believe in multidimensional community development, doesn't mean that we think that all of those areas are our core competencies. So, to be, you know, just like if you were an organization here in the U.S. and you needed some people who are working as accountants, some people who are working in, in marketing, and so. We, we understand that if we're going to affect change in the whole community, for instance, in Lawala, there's a very high demand for micro-lending, for micro-enterprise, just like there are many places in the developing world. We're not in the business of becoming a bank. But what we do bring is social capital. So I'm able, uh, as the representative of an organization, to go and meet with other NGOs that do provide micro-lending and to bring that as to bridge between them and the community. So. Maybe the question, and, and this gets to what you're saying, and um, if we do believe in integration, it also implies cooperation, that we agree together that this, the competitive spirit that sometimes exists between NGOs as if there's limited funding um, can be replaced by a spirit of, well, if, uh, we all do what we're best at, um, and we agree to do it cooperatively. We can, we can do it in a way that's comprehensive, that's balanced, that's integrated, whatever our holistic, whatever our nomenclature is for it. So that's my thought for the end of the night. And uh, I think this has been a really productive session and a really productive day with the whole group. So thank you. Well, this is a great way to close. I think that there's going to be a happy hour that people will continue to, to talk with the panelists. Um, just in closing, the, uh, the day, I think, is, is like some days we've had before in that we certainly talked across uh, disciplines and we talked across borders. But more than any other forum that I can remember, we also talked across generations. We even talked across species today in terms of what comprises global health. And I would just like to say, and it's an honor to say it on behalf of the Institute, how much we deeply appreciate all of the presenters. We want to especially again thank Chanta Nigon and Dr. Bill Pop for traveling all this way and joining us. What a pleasure and what a rich experience it has been to have you with us. Um, certainly to the Goolsbees, to the Nardellas, and all of you who presented today. Um, we appreciate that. The moderators, the team, Olivia and uh, her team back there are pretty amazing as they pull this off every day with glitches and all these things that make Sten Vermund crazy. And he had to leave us. So on behalf of Sten and everybody at the Institute, thank you all. And please join us um, for the reception, which is in ballroom A. And one thing someone asked me uh, to, to share with you, the organization One, which is an advocacy organization that is committed to reduction of poverty, HIV AIDS issues, et cetera, is having a function at the cabana tonight. So if after you enjoy your wine and your networking with us, you would like to go to the cabana and join with them, they will be discussing specifically uh, the effect of congr the congressional budget cut and how it will impact worldwide aid. 
So um, you're welcome to join them there. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.